Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Indian Express newspaper is one of the most important sources of current affairs for the civil services examination. Join us live every Thursday at 6 p.m. wherein we will discuss all the important news articles, editorials and columns from Indian Express. This initiative, Indian Express This Week, is exclusively available on the Baiju's exam prep app. Lecture number one will be conducted on both the platforms, YouTube as well as the app. From next week onwards, this session is exclusively available on the Baiju's exam prep app. The link to download the app is provided in the video description as well as a pinned comment. Do let us know what do you think of this initiative by liking this video, drop in your comments and do not forget to download the app. So press the like button and let's get started and look at column number one from Indian Express, drawing lines in high seas. China is an expansionist power. It wants to expand either its territory or the influence. Let's focus on Hamban Tota port, which is in Sri Lanka. This port was developed because of Chinese help with Chinese money. And this is where you need to understand one important concept known as debt trap. China uses its money, gives loan, unaffordable, unsustainable loans to smaller, poorer countries in the Indian Ocean and traps them in the debt. How? Hamban Tota port in Sri Lanka, developed through Chinese money, or China uses its financial institutions to provide loans to smaller and poorer countries and then traps them in the debt. Because once they are unable to repay that loan, China then takes over the installations, ports for example, infrastructure for example, and uses it for its geopolitical strength. And this Hamban Tota port, when it was developed with Chinese money, and Sri Lanka was not able to repay that loan because Sri Lanka right now is in a financial mess. The year was 2017. This Hamban Tota port was leased to China for 99 years. And this is what we call a debt trap. Trapping the smaller, poorer countries by giving them unsustainable loans and when these smaller countries are unable to repay those loans, ultimately China then takes over these vital installations, infrastructure and uses them for its geopolitical strength. But at the same time, you should also be aware of the string of pearls, series of investments made by the Chinese in the Indian Ocean. Myanmar, for example, Chittagong, Bangladesh, Hamban Tota port in Sri Lanka, the Gwadar port, Karachi, Pakistan, and basically encircling India. You will also be aware of One Belt, One Road initiative, which is another way of China capturing the geopolitical advantage. But we will strictly focus on this Hamban Tota port because this was in the news recently. And what is the controversy? The controversy is Yuang Wang file. It's a Chinese ship, a Chinese vessel. It had to dock on this Hamban Tota port on August 11. United States said, this is not an ordinary vessel. This is basically a spy ship. India also protested. And ultimately, Sri Lanka relented for some time and did not allow the docking of this ship on the Hamban Tota port. Ultimately, China also protested basically accused India of interfering in the foreign affairs of another country. But long story short, on August 16, this Yuang Wang 5 ultimately docked on the Humber Tota port, stayed there for six days, and according to newspaper reports, now it is sailing back. What is the issue? We will also discuss a very important news column, which was written by former Navy chief on August 10 in Indian Express. And what does this former Navy chief talk about? He says that we need to look at this with caution and look at this diplomatically looking at various angles. And which are these angles? Number one, this former Navy chief says Yuang Wang is basically a generic name 
of seven to eight ships and these ships belong to Chinese PLA's strategic support force. So Yuang Wang is a generic name for seven to eight ships or vessels belonging to the Chinese People Liberation Army's strategic support force. And Yuang Wang, what is its basic purpose? The purpose is to conduct research. The purpose is to monitor and track satellite launches and space launches. That is on paper the purpose of Yuang Wang. And this former Navy chief says, if we are objecting to this non-war vessel docking or entering into the Indian Ocean, then are we not violating United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea of the year 1982? What does this convey? According to this convention, which deals with how the vessels can enter the high seas or open waters, Chinese ships have the same right to enter the Indian Ocean as the Indian ships have to enter the South China Sea. So if according to this convention, unfettered power or unfettered permission is given to the vessels, ships to enter the high seas, to enter the open waters, how can we protest a non-war ship entering the Indian Ocean and docking on the Hamban Tota port? That's issue number one. But at the same time, China is not an ordinary country. China has an expansionist ideology, attitude. It wants to expand its influence or its territory. So the allegation is, and the concern is, which is a genuine concern, that these ships may be used for snooping, may be used for surveillance as well. But the former Navy chief says, it is okay. Okay in the sense, all the countries use their ships for surveillance, for snooping, not just an enemy country such as China, but even the friendly countries also use their infrastructure, their ships to do surveillance and snooping. United States, for example, it is always accused of conducting snooping exercises, surveillance exercises, even on her friends. So even if Chinese vessel, for, exa for example, is used for surveillance or snooping, we have to be cautious. But we cannot object to this vessel entering the Indian Ocean and docking on the Hambantota port because that would be the violation of UN clause of 1982. But then there is another issue involved in this, which is the Indo-Sri Lanka Peace Accord of 1987, where both countries, India as well as Sri Lanka, they have accepted that we will not allow our territory to be used against the unity, integrity and sovereignty of the other country. That means Sri Lanka is mandated by this Indo-Sri Lankan Peace Accord of 1987 not to use its territory prejudicial to the interest, to the unity, integrity and sovereignty of India. But the former Navy chief involves another cautionary note here. He says, look at Sri Lanka. It is under a financial mess. It's in a financial crisis. There has been a change in the government in Sri Lanka as well. We have been generous with Sri Lanka by providing economic support, by providing financial support. But that alone is not going to be enough for Sri Lanka to come out of this mess. So apart from Indian help, it needs the help from IMF as well, International Monetary Fund. But even IMF fund or money, is not going to help Sri Lanka, it needs Chinese help. So understand it from the perspective of Sri Lanka. It cannot be prejudicial to the interest of China as well, because China is financially supporting Sri Lanka as well. But at the same time, we need to address another issue. China is now focusing more on space projects, focusing more on various satellite launches as well. And now listen to me carefully. This year's target is 30 space launches for China. In April this year, three Chinese astronauts, they returned back to Earth after spending close to six months on a space station. 
So this former Navy chief basically says that it may be possible, it may be possible, let's give benefit of doubt, it may be possible that Yuang Wang 5 may be used for tracking, monitoring of these satellite launches and space projects because tomorrow if an untoward situation arises for rescue and search operations, China would need vessels, ships in the open ocean. Flip side to that, ISRO, Indian Space Research Agency, it is also going aggressive in terms of the satellite launches. DRDO may also have to test fire the Agni missile and to keep a track of these space explorations or space stations or satellite launches or even ballistic missile launches or missile launches, we may need our ships to enter the open waters so as to keep a track, so as to monitor these space launches and satellite launches. So that for our own rescue and search operations, we have to enter into the open seas. So tomorrow, if we need our ships to enter the open seas, to track and monitor the satellite launches and the space launches, in that case, how can we then justify our presence in the open waters? So it requires a cautionary tale. What is the issue? Hamban Tota port. String of pearls, dead trap, we have understood that. Now this is a vessel, a Chinese vessel, but China is an expansionist ideology. This Chinese vessel has now docked on the Hamban Tota port. US is protesting, India is protesting. How do we deal with the situation? Number one, China is helping Sri Lanka to come out of the economic and financial mess. So it has to be understood from that angle that Sri Lanka may not be completely sympathetic to our security challenges. That's number one. Number two, it is not a violation of Indo-Sri Lanka Peace Accord of 1987 because it was not a warship. But at the same time, if we object to a vessel coming in the Indian Ocean or in open waters because that country, forget about its ideology, that country on, on paper, it's saying that it is a civilian vessel or a, not a warship and we are using this vessel to track space launches, satellite launches and this is used only for purely civilian purposes. Tomorrow if we need our vessels, our ships also enter the open seas so that we can track our satellite launches, our missile launches, then how do we justify? So long story short, we need to have a pragmatic approach and we have to be cautious. How can we be cautious? We have to become a maritime power. China is a maritime power and we have to match China by investing more in our maritime capability. That's number one. Number two, we have to continue with our diplomatic mission to have good relations with the governments of these Indian Ocean countries so that through these diplomatic talks, we can ensure that these countries will not use or will not let their territory be used against interests which are prejudicial to India's unity, integrity and sovereignty. That is what you need to understand from this topic one. Then there is an editorial on his plate. Few days from now, we will have a new Chief Justice of India, Justice Yuyu Ladit. First thing that we need to understand is how is the Chief Justice of India appointed? The Chief Justice of India is appointed by the President, but the outgoing Chief Justice of India nominates his successor. If this successor is fit to hold the office, this is something very important. India is perhaps, and you would know that, India is perhaps the only country in the world where judges are appointed by themselves. How is the Chief Justice of India appointed? Appointed by the President. But what is the process? Outgoing Chief Justice of India nominates his successor. For example, Justice Deepak Misra, 
He nominated his successor, Justice Ranjan Gogoi, and Justice Ranjan Gogoi became the Chief Justice of India. When his term was about to get over, he nominated his successor, Justice Sharad Arvind Bobde, and S.A. Bobde was appointed as the Chief Justice of India. S.A. Bobde, before his retirement, nominated his successor, Justice Ramana. Justice Ramana is the Chief Justice of India. And Justice Ramana, before his retirement, has nominated his successor. And this successor should be the senior most judge of the Supreme Court, fit to hold the office. Now, there are two interpretations to this. Either the outgoing Chief Justice, listen to me carefully, either the outgoing Chief Justice would say that the senior most judge of the Supreme Court is not fit to hold the office. So he will not be recommended or if the outgoing chief justice nominates a successor and the government says because of some written data, because of some written valid excuse that this chief, this individual is not fit to hold the office, then this person will not be appointed. Clear? But something else because these days factual questions are asked by the UPSC and I will give you a factual question. Justice Yuyu Lalit has now been recommended swearing in ceremony in few days, nominated by his predecessor, Justice Ramana, and now Justice Yuju Lalit is going to be the next Chief Justice of India, 49th Chief Justice of India. But, factual thing, he is going to be the second Chief Justice who was nominated to the Supreme Court directly from Bar. Sir, what does that mean? Normally, who is appointed as the judge of a Supreme Court? Normally, somebody who has been a judge of a high court. Somebody who has been a judge of a high court normally is promoted to become the judge of a Supreme Court. But there have been instances where an advocate who was practicing in the Supreme Court, basically member of a bar who was practicing in the Supreme Court, is appointed as the judge of a Supreme Court. Similarly, Justice Yuyu Lalit he was directly appointed to the Supreme Court from the bar. He was a very influential lawyer. One of his high profile cases was when he defended the current union minister, Mr. Amit Shah, in Tulsiram Prajapati alleged fake encounter case. But be that as it may, Justice Yuyu Lalit was appointed to the Supreme Court directly from the bar and he is going to be the only second Chief Justice to become the Chief Justice because he was elevated from the bar. The first one was Justice S.M. Sikri. Justice S.M. Sikri was the first Chief Justice of India who was directly elevated from the bar. And now we have the second Chief Justice of India who was directly elevated from the bar and that person is Justice Yuyu Lalit. And this editorial talks about what is going to be on the plate of Justice Yuyu Lalit. Few issues such as pending crucial cases and judicial appointments. What does that mean? There are some cases which have been pending for a long time and the Supreme Court is evading these cases. And this is the concept which is known these days as judicial evasion. That means when judiciary is evading and not deciding, not ruling, not giving judgments on important cases, Thereby, technically, the judiciary is ruling in favor of the executive. For example, demonetization scheme of 2016, where the Prime Minister announced at 8 o'clock in November 2016 that from now onwards, from midnight, 500 and 1,000 denomination notes will cease to be a legal tender. Demonetization. It was challenged in the court on various grounds and one such ground was that it violates right to, right to property which is a constitutional right. And if you want to violate this right to property, for that you needed a law. Through law, you can deprive somebody of his property. But this order of demonetization was an executive order. It was not backed by a law. This demonetization scheme was challenged and till date, we don't have a verdict. Similarly, cases involving electoral bonds pending in the courts, in the Supreme Court since 2017. Similarly, challenges to the deoperationalization of Article 370 and downgrading Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories of JNK and Ladakh, pending in the Supreme Court. CAA, pending in the Supreme Court. So this editorial says that one 
important immediate challenge before the next Chief Justice of India is going to be how to resolve these crucial pending cases. Not just that, something else. And this is where I point out to an error in Indian Express. Indian Express says in 1950, the strength of the Supreme Court was Chief Justice of India and eight judges, which is wrong. In 1950, at the time of the commencement of the constitution, the strength of the Supreme Court was Chief Justice of India and seven other judges. So total there were eight judges, Chief Justice and seven other judges. So this article, this editorial says Chief Justice of India and eight judges, which is factually incorrect. That is something that you will have to correct. But not just that. Something happened and this is something which happened in January 2018. An unprecedented historic press conference was held by four judges of the collegium. So we have a collegium of Chief Justice of India and four senior judges of the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice of India then was Justice Deepak Misra. And four other judges of the collegium, one was Justice Chalameshwar, Justice Madan Lakur, Justice Kurian Joseph, Justice Ranjan Gogoi. These four judges addressed a historic, unprecedented press conference, basically saying, and I'm quoting them, the democracy is in danger. We have held multiple talks with the Chief Justice of India, but he's not listening. That is why we have no other option but to leave it before the court of the public that democracy is in danger. Why democracy is in danger? The allegation was that the Chief Justice of India is misusing his position as the master of the roster. And what is this master of the roster? Chief Justice of India has an administrative role as well. And what is that administrative role? As Chief Justice of India, he or she assigns cases to important judges. Who gets to hear land acquisition cases, who gets to hear PILs, who gets to hear tax related cases, who gets to hear election disputes, who gets to hear some other cases. So this is the role from the administrative side of the Chief Justice of India that he is the master of the roster. He manages the roster. And the allegation of these four judges against the Chief Justice of India was that of a bench fixing. What was the allegation? Allegation was that the Chief Justice of India is misusing his position of the master of the roster and is assigning cases to junior judges, sidelining the four senior judges of the Supreme Court. So their allegation is that important cases are given to junior judges, sidelining the members of the collegium. That is why these four judges at a historic press conference addressed and said democracy is in danger. But till date, this master of the roster power of the Chief Justice of India has not been addressed. This editorial says that is going to be the second challenge of the next Chief Justice of India, Justice Yuyu Lalit. Although the next Chief Justice of India is going to have a short tenure of close to 74 days. After that, another factual thing, Justice Chandrachur is going to be appointed as the Chief Justice of India, provided the Chief Justice nominates him as somebody who is fit to hold the office. And if that happens, Justice Chandrachur will create history. Previously, his father, Justice Chandrachur, was the Chief Justice of India. He served many years. In fact, his was the longest tenure out of all the Chief Justice of India. And if it happens, it will become the first ever that son as well as father have been the Chief Justices of the Supreme Court of India. That's another fact. And the third issue that this editorial is raising is about judicial appointments. Normally, whenever a recommendation is given by the collegium to the executive, it is binding on the executive. But executive can always ask for reconsideration of that advice, saying, maybe we don't agree with this nomination of yours, can you please reconsider? But if the collegium reiterates the same name, it is binding on the executive to appoint that individual. Yet we have seen that executive is delaying the appointment. One example that this editorial cites is of advocate Saurabh Kirpal, 
according to this editorial, he was recommended to the Supreme Court by the Supreme Court Collegium last year. And for one year, the executive is sitting on this nomination, is not appointing Mr. Kirpal as the judge of a Supreme Court. And that is on the plate of the next Chief Justice of India. One, how do you address crucial pending cases? Because there is this concept of judicial evasion, that judiciary is evading decisions and verdicts on important cases, thereby indirectly favoring the executive. Second is on how do we tackle this master of the roster issue? And third is on judicial appointments. That is what you need to know from this editorial on his plate. Let's come to the other important column written by India's foremost social scientist, Pratap Banu Mehta. And he talks about Bilkis Banu case. February 2002, let me give you a small context. Sabarmati Express. It was burnt. 58 sadhus, car sevaks who were coming from Ayodhya were burnt alive. What followed this burning of Sabarmati Express? It led to communal riots in Gujarat in the year 2002. One victim of this communal violence was Bilkis Banu. She was pregnant at the time of the assault. In fact, her three, three and a half year old child, the head was, uh, let's not get into that. The head was thrown into, was touched by a rock. The child dies and she was pregnant and ultimately she was gang raped. She filed an FIR. FIR was filed. Investigation took place. But there was this allegation that there is a pressure on the witnesses the investigation is not proper, the investigation may not be fair because the incident happened in Gujarat, the trial investigation is also in Gujarat, so it may not be a fair investigation. This matter was then taken up by the Central Bureau of Investigation. Very important fact and I'll tell you slightly later why. This trial or this investigation was conducted by CBI and the case was then transferred to Maharashtra. And this is also important and I'll tell you why. So one, this case involving gang rape was investigated by a central agency, CBI, and this trial was transferred to Maharashtra. And now in the year 2008, 11 accused were declared guilty. They were declared guilty of the gang rape and ultimately they were sentenced to life imprisonment. Later on, the Supreme Court also upheld this verdict and decided to punish these individuals for life imprisonment. But if you are serving life imprisonment, there is a power under Article 72 of the Constitution which is available with the President. And there is a power available under Article 161 of the Constitution which is available with the Governor of the State. And what is that power? The power is that of remission. What do we mean by remission? If somebody has been sentenced to 14 years in jail, this 14 year sentence can be remitted, the sentence can be reduced or you can be set free after serving 14 years in jail. That's remission. But there is another important section Section 433 capital A of CRPC and this is basically a limitation on the pardoning powers of the president and the governor. What is this limitation? If an individual, look at me carefully, if an individual has committed a crime for which the punishment is death, if an individual has committed a crime for which the punishment is death, but you were not given death sentence, you were given life imprisonment. You were not given death sentence, you were given life imprisonment. This individual who has been convicted for a crime for which the punishment is death but was given life imprisonment, you cannot remit the sentence of this individual unless and until he or she has served 14 years in jail. Now these individuals who were sentenced to life imprisonment. 
they have already served more than 14 years in jail now they applied for remission this is where it becomes interesting Gujarat government said we cannot release you why because the trial was conducted in Maharashtra so Maharashtra government will have to release you now one of the individuals one of the convicts approached the Supreme Court and asked the Supreme Court that you need to clarify if remission will happen who will take that decision Supreme Court said this decision will be taken by Gujarat why because the crime happened in Gujarat so what the investigation or the trial was completed in Maharashtra so Gujarat will have to look at this petition of remission not just that something else as well in Gujarat there were rules of 1992 and the rules of 2014 rules related to prison why because prison is a state subject in the distribution of powers between union list state list and concurrent list prison is a state subject so states will have to have their own powers of making rules regarding remission regarding prison 1992 rules were made for remission and these rules had no exception what do we mean by no exception the prison rule said whoever has completed 14 years regardless of the crime there was no such concept of who is eligible for remission who is ineligible for remission regardless of your crime if you have completed 14 years in jail you are eligible for remission and at the same time the executive in Gujarat will decide these cases these rules of 1992 were invalidated by the Supreme Court in 2012 Supreme Court said no these rules are not valid why because when you decide on remission look at me carefully when you decide on remission you have to also take the opinion of a judge who gave this verdict according to these 1992 rules there was no such provision of eliciting the opinion of a judge who gave the punishment in the first place now the Supreme Court is saying after invalidating these 1992 rules saying you need to seek the opinion of a judge who has given that verdict who has given that order who has given that ruling and ultimately basis on the Supreme Court judgment in 2014 new rules of remission were made in Gujarat and according to these rules some are ineligible who are ineligible somebody who has been booked under gang rape which means Bilkis Banu is one such individual second we will not have remission done for an individual for a convict whose case was investigated by the Central Bureau of Investigation which means Bilkis Banu case which was investigated by the CBI and this was basically a gang rape under 2014 rules these convicts were ineligible for remission but one such convict approached the Supreme Court and said first tell us who will decide on our remission Maharashtra or Gujarat court said Gujarat second please consider us under 1992 rules why and rightly so because you have to consider the rules which were applicable at the time of the crime so if the crime happened in 2002 and the rules were of 1992 which basically means 1992 rules will be applicable for these convicts new rules which says under CBI case we will not remit and those involved in gang rape we will not remit these rules were made only in 2014 so technically it is okay to release these convicts remit their sentence because of 1992 rules but what Pratap Banu Mehta writes he asks and he quotes Bilkis Banu by asking this question is is this how justice ends because according to Pratap Banu Mehta Bilkis Banu she reposed faith in the judiciary in the institutions of justice in this country but that's not the only issue one part of this issue is the legal issue and I've explained the technicality of that legal issue but the other is a social issue as well because when these convicts were released 
And after their release, they were garlanded with flowers. They were given sweets as if they had done something spectacular. So it is that spectacle of convicts, convicts of a heinous crime, being garlanded with flowers and given sweets, that is speaking volumes about the society we are living in, according to Pratap Banu Mehta. Now this case is again in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court today has issued a notice to the Gujarat government asking how and when did you make these remission for these 2008 convicts. That is what you need to understand from this topic is this how justice ends. But I'll tell you some more detail related to section 288A. What is the section? 2012, December 16, if I'm right, one 23-year-old, one 23-year-old physiotherapist student was gang raped in a moving bus and she ultimately lost her life as well. We call her Nirbhaya. And when that horrific gang, gang rape happened, there were people on the streets demanding justice, demanding the culprits be hanged and they demanded stricter laws stricter laws to tackle the violence and crimes against women. But do we know the name of the victim, the original name of the victim? But we only know her as Nirbhaya. What is her name? We don't know. Why? Because there is a limitation under section 288A. You cannot disclose the identity of the rape victim because if you disclose the identity of the rape victim, it will cause annoyance to her, it would be difficult for her to get job, to settle, settle basically in Indian terms, to get married. Basically, she will be looked down upon by the society. So you don't have to reveal the identity of the rape victim. So if we don't know the real name of Nirbhaya, how do we know the real name, Bilkis Banu, who was subjected to gang rape? Because one exception, and this can be important for your prelims exam, one exception is the adult victim of gang rape or rape, she can allow voluntarily in the written that you can use my name. If she does that, then her name can be used. Otherwise, you have to, you don't have to disclose the identity of the rape victim. That is something that can be important for your exam. Now, let's jump to something else. Lakshman Naskar versus Union of India 2000. This is the guideline that the Supreme Court has provided for remission. Normally, how do you consider people for remission? We take into account uh, their age, we take into account their conduct in the jail, but at the same time, Supreme Court in 2000, and this can be asked in your examination, because these judgments have been asked in the examination, for example, SR Bombay judgment has been asked, uh, HR, uh, IR Kolo judgment has been asked, Keshavananda Bharti judgment has been asked, other judgments have been asked, provided they are in the news. Lakshman Naskar versus Union of India, it lays down certain conditions on the basis of which remission can be done by the state. One such is, what is the purpose being served if we keep the convict in jail? This is the consideration. What is the purpose being said if we keep these convicts in jail? If there is no purpose, release them. Second, socio-economic conditions of the convict's family. That is also taken into account while deciding on these remission pleas. Third, Can this convict again commit a crime? Is there a potential of this individual committing the same crime again or committing any other crime? These are the considerations that the state has to keep in mind while deciding upon the remission pleas. Done? Let's look at another important editorial, misogyny in court. There are two individuals involved. One is the judge S. Krishna Kumar, judge in Kerala, a sessions judge because a court when it deals with criminal cases, we call this court a sessions court. 
and the judge who hears this criminal case, we call him the Sessions Judge. Clear? So Sessions Judge is Krishna Kumar. And then we have a writer, social activist, Civic Chandran. These are the two protagonists in this episode. What is the case? Case 2. One, Atrocities Act. SCST Prevention of Atrocities Act, which is popularly known as the Atrocities Act. And the second is Section 354 of Indian Penal Code, which talks about outraging the modesty of a woman. What is the case? There is a Dalit writer. She accused this social activist, Sivik Chandran, of sexual harassment. Since the writer is Dalit, case number one, Atrocities Act. Since it is outraging the modesty of the woman, section 354, outraging the modesty of a woman. Now the judge has to hear this case and the case involves bail. Sivik Chandran basically asked for bail in both these cases and Justice S. Krishna Kumar is making some startling observations. Observation number one under Atrocities Act, the judge says release this person on bail. Why? Because we cannot understand and we cannot think that this social activist will touch the body of a woman knowing that she is a Dalit. It will take some time for you to process this rational, this reasoning, but let me repeat it again. This is not a case under Atrocities Act because we cannot think, or I cannot think, according to the judge, that this writer would have touched the body of this writer knowing that she is a Dalit. That is why there is no case under Atrocities Act release on bail, number one. Number two, the judge was shown some photographs. And according to the judge, this Dalit writer was wearing provocative dress. In India, unfortunately, the length of the dress of a woman decides her character. And this judge says that since this woman was wearing provocative dress, it means that she may be wanting it. That means it is not outraging the modesty of the woman because this lady, this Dalit writer was wearing provocative, judge, provocative clothes. And this is the editorial on this, misogyny in court. And this misogyny we have been witnessing for a long time now. If you would know, there was a case in Rajasthan, Bamri Devi case, where she was gang raped, or the allegation was that there was a gang rape on Bamri Devi. She was a social activist. She was basically wanting, urging the people not to get their children married before they complete their, before they cross the legal marriageable age and she was gang raped. And the court acquitted all the accused and do you know what was the reason? One reason was accused one is uncle, accused two is nephew. We cannot understand in Indian contest how can uncle rape somebody in presence of the nephew or how can nephew rape somebody in presence of the uncle. On this and various other grounds, the accused were set free. Misogyny. Second instance, it happened in Madhya Pradesh. There was a rape case against a man. And now this individual was to be released on bail. The court said, we will release you on bail, but first you have, the, you have to have the Rakhi tied by this rape victim. And now you have to protect her as if she is your sister. On this ground, bail was granted. Okay. Another instance, a judge in Maharashtra, uh, Bombay High Court, he was a temporary judge, Bombay High Court, she released an individual saying uh, it was a POXO case, prevention of uh, children from the sexual offences case. The judge said unless and until there is skin to skin contact, there is no sexual harassment, there is no outraging the modesty, there is no rape case. This is what we call judicial Stereotyping. If you are wearing a provocative dress, which means nobody can assault you. 
and what is this on your screen it is basically an art illustration initiative by the university at the university of arkansas the theme of this art initiative was what were you wearing so the question was asked to all the victims of rape what were you wearing when you were subjected to this agony of rape and this is what they were wearing so it doesn't matter what your dress is rape is a rape it doesn't matter that you are wearing provocative dresses this judicial stereotyping must end and for that the irony is that this judge comes from kerala where there is a there are beautiful 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 progress made on the dignity of, of a woman and a judge saying this in kerala which is known for its gender equality or some sense of gender equality is even more puzzling so what do we need then we need gender sensitization of the judges but at the same time we need periodic evaluation of the performance of the judges so that we can remove the dead wood those who are not fit to hold the high office of judiciary they need to be excluded they need to be removed clear now let's look at the last editorial from for this lecture stepping back stepping back and forth on rohingya is dispiriting it also highlights the need for a refugee law one thing united nations convention on the status of refugees which is also known as a refugee convention 1951 and then there was an additional protocol signed in 1967 but india has neither is not a party to united nations convention on the status of refugees of 1951 nor its additional protocol of 1967 but then what is the difference this refugee convention of 1951 it basically focused on european immigrants those who were subjected to displacement because of the second world war and those who were displaced before 1st jan 1951 so this convention on refugees was basically targeting focusing on the european immigrants who had to flee because of the second world war so there was a geographical limitation only europeans there was a time limit as well only till or before 1st january 1951 we will take only these instances this additional protocol of 1967 removed the geographical limitation removed the time limit as well that means doesn't matter we don't only deal with europeans we will deal with all immigrants all refugees and at the same time we won't only talk about before 1st jan 1951 we'll talk forever and it is this law which talks about what is the status of a refugee what is the liability of a state which grants asylum to these refugees and what are then the rights of these asylum seekers or these refugees and the most important part of this united nation convention is the principle of non refoulement and what is this principle of non refoulement for example we have myanmar and in myanmar we have rohingyas rohingyas are predominantly muslims because of the military janta there there is a military coup in myanmar also prior to that when there was a government uh, of aung san suu kyi's party in myanmar there was some uh, violence committed against the rohingyas and ultimately they had to flee some went to bangladesh some came to india as well in fact according to statistics close to 40000 rohingyas are in india some are there in jammu and kashmir some are there in delhi according to the principle of non refoulement if the asylum seeker is entering into a country for example india 
India cannot send these Rohingyas back to Myanmar because in Myanmar their life is in danger. According to the principle of non-refoulement, if there is an asylum seeker who is coming to this country, this country cannot deport this asylum seeker back to the, their country or any country where their life is in danger. Now the challenge was, these Rohingyas who have come to India, how do we deal with them? The government says they are not asylum seekers, they are not refugees, they are basically illegal migrants. And these illegal migrants should be identified and should be deported back to Myanmar. Petition was filed in the Supreme Court as well to prevent the deportation of these Rohingyas. And ultimately Supreme Court dismissed that petition, allowed the deportation of these Rohingyas back to Myanmar. When the question came on what about principle of non-refoulement, the government of India's position was that since we have not we are not a party to this United Nations Convention on the Status of Refugees 1951, nor are we part of the Additional Protocol of 1967, which means this principle of non refoulement is not applicable to us. That was the policy of the government. But now something happened. Union Minister for Housing and Urban Affairs, Hardeep Singh Puri, he said that we will provide some support to these Rohingyas, we will also give them UNHCR IDs, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee IDs. We will also give them basic amenities and they will be shifted to EWS flats in Bakarwala in Delhi. And within few hours, there was a tweet by the Union Home Ministry saying this is not the policy of the government of India. So this stepping back, back and forth of the government on this Rohingya is dispiriting. And this editorial says there is a need for a refugee law. And one more thing that you have to keep in mind is that there is no such law on refugees in India. In fact, there is a private member's bill introduced in the parliament by Dr. Shashi Thurur, which talks about that we need a just, humane refugee law because India has accepted refugees in the past. From the East Pakistan, when Pakistan was committing assaults on the Bangladeshis, we accepted them, the Tibetan refugees, the Tamils, uh, the refugees from Sri Lanka. So we've accepted them. So we need a strong refugee law, a humane refugee law to tackle the situation. That is it for today. Thank you so much for staying with us, for being with us. I hope you have liked this session. If yes, press the like button. Do drop in your comments and do not forget to download the Baiju's exam prep app. See you next week. Thursday, 6 p.m. with another session on Indian Express this week. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye.